What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Couple Things. With Sean and Andrew. A podcast all about couples. And the things they go through. I am getting noticeably more pregnant. Welcome back to I can't even tell, babe. Yeah. I can't even tell. I can't I, I also can't believe we're rolling live right now. You, you can, just kind of jumped into this. Yeah, you can also tell I'm getting noticeably more pregnant, not by size, babe. But, but by, by attitude. Standard of um <laughs> dress? Yes. Fashion? Yeah. I think you look great. My standard just starts plummeting towards the end. What are you going for now? If it's not looks, it's um just straight comfort. That's great. The easiest transition into bed. Well, you look beautiful regardless, babe. Thanks, babe. Welcome back you to look another episode. Thank you. I appreciate that. Got the beard going on. First you time do. ever. I'm excited about it. It's been going on, it's been going strong here for a while. Mm-hmm. I've been I'm, I'm gonna impressed. go big with it. I'm going to be Santa Claus this year. Welcome okay. back to another episode of Wild Stories with Sean and Andrew, where we are just on the on the process in the journey, in the process and on the journey of documenting some of our weirder experiences in life. And a lot of people get giggles or maybe slightly jarred from some of the stories that we've shared. Yeah. And also the feedback has been, actually, can I just read some of these comments? Please. Because a lot of people are like, wow, these are really just stories about Andrew doing, <laughs> making bad life choices. <laughs> yeah. Which, I mean. It kind of sums it up, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so, first of all, shout out to everyone who's been watching. I'm uh, glad you guys are enjoying this. If you haven't yet, please subscribe, follow, wherever you listen to podcasts, comment. Um, the more comments, the better, because it gives us more things to talk about. First of all, a lot of people said that they had the same experience with education as you did. Uh, Crystal Schimmelman said mm. that she had a similar experience as you, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, let's see. Mary Lou said that she's 65 years old. She started college when she was 18, and then she went back to school to take online classes. Love that. Um, we also mispronounced, w one checker said that we min mispronounced uh, Kai Bob, it's it's Kai Bab, Kai Bab, Kai Bab, yeah. Mm. It just goes to show we had no business being on the Grand Canyon slope side. Yes, honestly, this is just a random collection of our stories. <laughs> um, Sean's gonna curate our first story for today. Drum roll, please. Uh, let's just start with the Boston Marathon because that one was fun. Oh, for who? Both of us. Okay, so we had the opportunity to work with Cliff Bar, which is like a dream come true. My dad. Grew up playing football. Yep. Actually, my grandpa was not into sports at all. Okay. Okay. He was an academic. He was like yes. the dean of IUPUI in Indianapolis. He used to. Uh, didn't we? Didn't he become a professor at Stanford? Um, he went to Stanford. I don't gotcha. know if he was a professor there. I should double check. You should double check that. That, but he was also a moderator for like presidential debates. The guy was top notch. Anyway, education kind of took him from uh, poverty to like living a. Mm -hmm you know, life with kids and they had a healthy family life. It was great. So he thought that was like the only route. So my dad comes along and he's interested in sports. My grandpa was not really excited about it, but my dad played football. After he played football, he was doing Ironman triathlons and stuff and was like just really into it. So, um, my, my dad set this whole tone for endurance sports yep. of which I have no genes associated with this i have no endurance that is the most blatantly false statement you and your brothers have a cardiac threshold that i have never seen before of course your oldest brother has like the most insane ability for endurance because he was a cyclist i appreciate you saying that but i don't know if it's true um but what, I, is. what I was going with that is we were always larger people doing endurance sports. My dad even created Team Clydesdale, which yeah. if you are in the like marathon triathlon world, you'll show up and there, there's like a Clydesdale division. It's a legitimate like USA triathlon division now, which is wild. It's crazy. So, because a lot of people that do endurance, you're gonna like you just naturally lose weight. You're mm -hmm. or naturally smaller people. So if you're above 200 pounds, there's this whole division called the Clydesdale division for you. We've always been that. <laughs> um, Sean is way more of just generally like an athlete than us. Uh, so we worked with Cliff Bar and that was a big deal because it was, it was always like Cliff Bar was, it's, it's the brand. It's it like it the, is the brand. 
in this it, world. I feel like it's similar to like a Red Bull in the sense of like they're so heavily involved in so many athletic events that it's it's such an honor to be affiliated with them. Yes. So he signed a partnership with Cliff Bar, and part of this partnership was every year they had charity spots um, in the Boston Marathon. And the very first year that we signed with them, we got to go watch the Boston Marathon. Yes. And, you know, create content and just like talk about it. And then the second year, they gave us one of their charity spots. They gave me a charity spot. Yeah. And it was going to be, you know, Sean Johnson runs the Boston Marathon, which, which has been on deal. my bucket list forever. Again, if you know, the Boston Marathon is like really hard to qualify for. You have to run, I think, a sub three hour marathon yep. just about around there if you're a male. And up until that point, I had done a lot of partnership work with Nike and I had ran 13 half marathons for Nike. Um, and I loved all of them, but never did I cross the finish line and be like, oh, I could do this again right now. So Sean's <clears throat> into it. She's good at it. She's trained for it. And here I am in the supportive role, like, you got this, babe. I'm so <laughs> excited to watch you do this and, you know, accomplish this big goal. And it was three months, probably? Before. Three months before the Boston Marathon. Surprise! I got pregnant. <laughs> um, which was a surprise, because if you guys know our story, we were coming off miscarriage. We weren't sure when we were going to start trying again. We thought it would take a long time. It had been taking a long time. So it was a surprise. We were trying, but naively didn't think it would happen before the race. We just thought it would take a while. So we're in this position where we're working with like this top notch brand. Yeah. Want to make sure that they're they've been, happy. They've been pushing out all this like marketing material that I'm going to be racing, articles and everything. And the solution that I think Sean came up with, thank you so much. Yes, Sean, baby. Was. How about Andrew runs for me? What It'll great be great idea. content. I'll be pregnant. What a great idea. I mean, people usually train for marathons on maybe like a six-month training cycle. So I had three months to, to get onboarded here. I'm also concurrently playing with the Washington uh, football team. Was it Washington or was it? Yeah, it was. It was Washington. It was Washington. And so in the NFL, they, they have these weight thresholds. You're kind of assigned to weight. <laughs> Based off your position, so like O-linemen usually weigh over 300 pounds. Quarterbacks, they don't really have a weight restriction on. But for my position, long snapper, th they said, you need to weigh 245 pounds. Yeah. And if you show up. Which is heavy for you. Yeah, and the heavier the better. Yes. So, and if you show up beneath that weight, then they'll fine you. The NFL like allows yes. these weight fines. It was something like five hundred or thousand dollars a pound per pound, guys. So I naturally <clears throat> probably weigh two hundred thirty pounds. The NFL wanted me at two hundred forty five, and with marathons, it's kind of the lighter the better. <laughs> and the way the schedule worked out is the Boston Marathon was on April sixteenth, sixteenth, our anniversary. My first day of training with the Washington Football Team was April seventeenth. April seventeenth, the next day. So. I'm doing these trainings. I'm like pretty disciplined with it. But my strategy was in order to not lose so much weight that I, I couldn't regain it the next day, I was not going to do the long run. So usually you'd, you'd work up to like a 22-mile run in training and show up and do the marathon. I think marathon. your longest run was 10 miles. No, I, I did I did, I did, the 13.1. I did a half marathon. And you did all of it on the treadmill. On the treadmill. Yes. <laughs> Be, yes. So I'm doing these runs. I'm feeling good. Yep. I'm running 13.1. Yep. Feeling good. Like yep. this is going to be cake, not an issue. My goal was to run a sub four hour marathon. Um, and I show up that day. There had been a lot of press around this too since Sean was out there. So there's people on the course with signs yeah. like go Sean and Andrew or <laughs> yeah. you got this Andrew. like every mile there was someone for Andrew and so the race starts and you're like you're prepared you're feeling good well you're as prepared as you know and I because of the position we're in with Cliff Bar and the Boston Marathon we have access to a car in back roads that allows us to go see Andrew at every single mile marker, which is wild. It wild. was so cool. 
But I also had like all the apps and stuff and I was tracking him and I was like, dude is crushing it. You were like seven minute mile, seven minute mile, seven minute mile. I would go to the mile marker. I'd see him cross it. I'd be so excited. Sean, <laughs> the, the the group they put me in to run with was all professional runners. So Scott Jurek, who wrote a book on running, he did the whole Appalachian Trail. There was like some of these best, best athletes in the world that do ultra marathons. Yeah. Are in my group running, so they're they're trying to help pace me. Yes, but I'm antsy. I'm excited. I'm also trying to flex a little bit. You and were so, you were put in that group because they wanted they were protecting you. They were pacing you, giving you the professional like assistance you needed to get through it. And I I shot myself in the foot because we yeah we came out too hot. This is the moral of the story. Yeah. And sure enough. I'm running a strong pace yeah. for the first 13.1 miles. But as soon as yep. the 14th mile comes around, Sean starts checking my splits. And slowly, I just start deteriorating. And my yes. time, I'm, I'm adding like 30 seconds per, um, um, per mile pace. And, and then, it's... so it was around this time where it got trickier and trickier with the car to try to hit every mile marker. And no offense, wait, but your pace started becoming like super inconsistent. So we didn't know where I was going to be. Yeah. And I remember we got to mile, what was it, 18? <laughs> I think it was 18 or 19. And by this time, you're running like a 10-minute pace. And so we're standing there waiting. And it doesn't like fully track through the Boston, like through the Boston Marathon, there's little glitches of, of places where like you lose like the full tracing on your map. And we lost your tracing, and it was like 18 minutes. Thank you so much for reminding me. I, <laughs> I, I took a screenshot of the, of the splits. And I was I like, put him on here. is he alive? Is he at a medical tent? What's happening? Like, we were starting to freak out a little bit. So we start out, I start out on the course. I'm high-fiving all these people that are out here. They're like, Andrew, you got this. It's so fun. And then by mile 18, I was literally hiding my face yes. from anyone. <laughs> Trying to walk on the other side of the road so they wouldn't recognize me. I saw you coming and, in, and you were walking and, like, head slung. And I was like, oh, no. I have a pretty high tolerance for pain. And when I set my mind to something, usually I'm able to, to grind through it and persevere. The marathon, that marathon was one of the only times in my life where I, I was not sure that I could physically do <laughs> there, I, I'm at oh. mile 25, and there's 1.2 miles left. Yeah. In any other situation, I'm like, no, that's nothing. Yeah. I can easily do that. <laughs> And sure enough, like the the home stretch of the Boston Marathon is this yep. epic strip. Uh, it's so amazing. Is it called Boyle Street? I forget. Maybe. Anyway, it's it's iconic and it's packed with people. <laughs> and in my mind, I'm I'm thinking, I I'm gonna run this last stretch because I was walking quite a bit, and I physically couldn't do it. I I, just, I was just I was just walking the whole time because I was in such physical pain. Um, but we finished. You finished. And I did a I did a kind of a lame cartwheel across the line. And I. Then, I was impressed that you didn't collapse. Well, what happened after that, though? So this is where it got even crazier. After he crossed the finish line. So I kind of had all these these things planned anyways. But as I saw him throughout the race, I was like, okay, I need to put all measures in place to help him because he has to report to camp the next day. Thank goodness. And has to do like full workouts and weight room and all these things. So as soon as he crossed the finish line... He had a five-hour window, I think, I before you had to be at the airport Yeah, to catch your flight to make it to camp on time. And literally, by the time you cross the finish line, it takes probably an hour to like kind of process, like get out of all the chaos and the security and everything. So you meet back at the hotel. At the hotel in our room, I have waiting a doctor... Um, someone to administer an IV, someone to like look you over, make sure you like check your vitals, like everything. She had hooked up a ice bath for me. I had an ice bath ready. I had food ready of all varying types. And I was like, this is perfect. This is basically going to be like rehab 101. We're going to come in here. We're just going to like <laughs> throw you in the ice bath, set up an IV, have the doctor look you over. Especially going into camp the next day, he was going to have to go through physicals with another doctor. So I wanted to make sure you were all set and clear. 
And he gets into the room and he basically, the doctors are like waiting for him. And you basically like fold over onto the bed and pass out. And I was like, babe, you have to get into the ice bath. Like don't, you cannot let your muscles just like, whatever, you have to get into the ice bath. And you were so pissed. You were like, I'm not doing any of this stuff. And I I was like, (laughs) stop being a baby. Get in the freaking ice bath. Sean, you're so sympathetic. Thank you, babe. So I, I got in the ice bath for maybe five seconds and I had to get out. I I felt worse doing the Grand Canyon. And if you want to listen to that story, I think it's in part two, Wild Stories. <laughs> but I felt pretty bad after the marathon. Yeah. To the point I just wanted to take a nap and fall asleep. I know. So I did. I just laid on the bed. Sean had an IV in every arm, I think. <laughs> yeah. This guy. Yes. <laughs> and you had gotten all this food. I was not hungry because I, I felt so weird. You were so depleted. But I'll tell you what. You hooked up those IVs. As soon as those were done, I went from being a zombie. Yeah. Just totally out of it to like, I could have ran another marathon, dude. I was ready to go. Those I don't know what they put in that stuff. said you were so depleted. I mean, it was all, it. W- there was no like magic juice in there. It right. was just electrolytes and stuff. It was, it, we had to adhere to the NFL standards and like everything. But um, the doctors were like, he's in rough shape. But- I landed in D.C. I took an ice bath, took a bunch of Advil. I ate like three pizzas that night. Because you had to get your weight back up. Pizzas always would just pack on the weight for me artificially before I would do these they NFL weigh-ins. in your stomach. Um, and then I'll never forget, I showed up the next day. Nobody knew. Nobody knew what I did, yeah. which was great. That was the plan. And I snapped and performed really well that day. But didn't you have to squat? Wasn't the first weight no, room no, workout either. squat? <laughs> I mean, that would have been I, I so brutal. But they took our body comp too. Usually I, oh I'm like 14% body fat and I was eight. They were like, what did you do in the off season? <laughs> it's like, well, I just, I just dehydrated myself. And uh, how can you be eight, eight percent body fat, but then also be up to 245? This is like the fourth story we've told that is a strong indicator of why I didn't make the NFL in retrospect. <laughs> There was no chance I was ever going to have you that did. as my career. But you did. Babe. I would much rather do these exciting things than, than playing the NFL for 15 years, you know? Yeah. Okay, so I have two more stories that I want to try to get through with this episode. We've been telling you a lot of like self-deprecating funny ones. Wait. We didn't close out that last story. One second. <laughs> I go to my first day of training camp, and Sean wanted to celebrate our anniversary in New York City. So... We, I go through practice. Well, we had a work thing that we had to do in New York City. We were uh, the long shot yeah. movie we were going to the premiere of, which was awesome. You should watch it if you haven't. So I go to my first day of practice. We get out at maybe 1 o'clock. I jump on a plane back to New York, and we meet up in New York City, Times Square. I'll never forget this clip. She was st- shot dying I laughing. I could not stop laughing. As I'm running up to her with peg legs. Andrew like, could <laughs> barely walk. <laughs> and we had a great anniversary. It was really great. And then we really split good. ways again. Yeah. And we did vlog all that, but that's yeah. coming to behind the scenes. Life the <laughs> NFL. Okay. So two stories I wanted to get through um, just to kind of give different vibes. Okay. We'll start with gym flooding. Wow. Okay. Let's take you back to 2008. Really? This a gr- it's a crazy story. It is a crazy story. Okay. 2008. <laughs> this is going to be very one-sided. Sorry, guys. Um, 2008. I was... Two weeks out from Olympic trials. Um, So this was like final stretch, getting ready to head to trials. From trials, the team would be selected. We would fly straight to Beijing, China. Um, I am from Des Moines, Iowa, if you guys didn't know that. And two weeks before these Olympic trials, I'm like grinding in the gym. We're basically trying to finesse like the final little things headed into trials But the last two weeks are very important. You can't just like coast. You're not just not training or anything. You're you're grinding. And exactly at that two week marker, we had a horrible, horrible storm hit Des Moines, Iowa, where um, like the whole city flooded. It was it was devastating to a lot of people. And in this flood, um, it actually hit our gym overnight, our gymnastics gym, and it it like took our whole gym. So it was five feet of water through the whole gym, ruined every piece of equipment, shut our gym down. And I remember it was in the middle of the night. 
I was like oblivious. Again, I was living in like this bubble, but I was completely oblivious at the time. I was dating this guy named Johnny. Um, Johnny. Johnny. And I remember getting like a text from him late at night. It was like 9 or 10 p.m. maybe. And I was like, one, it was odd for him to text me that late, especially given my career. We had routines. He knew I went to bed at like 8, whatever. And he was like texting or calling and he's like, I'm headed to your gym or like I'm at your gym. It's a weird text to get. It's a very weird text. I was like, I don't understand. Why, what are you doing? Are you vandalizing my gym or something? Like what's happening? He's like, no, we're, we're sandbagging it as the storm is coming in really bad. I was like, what? So I ended up driving to the gym with permission from my parents um, in the middle of the night. And there were hundreds of people from the community, hundreds, at our gym, sh- bringing in sandbags from all over the city to try to like protect our gym from being flooded. So it hadn't flooded yet. Which was wild. It was such a wild thing to see. Because for context, if you think about a gymnastics gym, you're talking the f- a floor, which is almost a carpet-like texture that shouldn't be wet. You got these foam pits that are foam and shouldn't be wet. You have all this leather stuff that gets yeah. really slippery when it gets wet. And it's not a, it's not a friendly place for water. But it was it was kind of like this SOS call that my, my coach had sent out to our whole gym. He was like, if anybody's available, please come help like save his gym. And so there were hundreds of people there that night sandbagging. And we got to a point where like the storm started to come in. So everybody had to leave. I went home. Chow was not happy that I was there that night. He was like, you should be in bed. I was like, Chow, what? I'm not going to be like a selfish person just sleeping while everybody does this. Um, And I remember waking up early the next morning. And it's kind of like that pit in your stomach of like, okay, what happened? And I remember I jumped in my car, drove down to the gym, couldn't get like within a half mile of it because it, the streets were so flooded and you just kind of knew. Um, and I remember talking to my dad and talking to my parents and calling Chow and the gym was five feet underwater. People were taking canoes all the way to the gym trying to like salvage things from the gym. Um, memories, like framed pictures that Chow had, trophies, trying to salvage like any equipment because gymnastics equipment is also very, very expensive. And I remember it being one of those moments where, like, I didn't know what to think of it. At the time, it wasn't a huge deal. And I I need to paint this picture carefully because there were so many people who lost their homes and lost, like, their livelihood. There were right? bigger issues, yeah. 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 It was a gymnastics gym. Yes. It was my, my coach, who's, like, my second dad. It was his livelihood. It was his career. But we are all still very lucky that we didn't lose our homes, but so many people did. And I remember I had training that day, and I was like, what do we do? This is kind of weird. And um, we ended up driving down to Iowa State University every single day, and we would train there for about a week. And in the course of a week, I'm skipping over a lot of things. Um, The governor of Iowa set out he sent out like this kind of SOS request and within 24 hours, the water level started to subside. They had dammed up like the river. They had kind of gotten a lot of the water out of the city, but the governor had sent thousands of people to Chow's gymnastics because I use this lightly, but like because Sean Johnson from Des Moines, Iowa, had to make it to Olympic trials. Iowa is a special place, and if you think about it, there's one just statistically not as many people in Iowa as there are other places, yeah. and also statistically fewer people that go out onto this world stage. I mean, yeah. Zach Johnson is a golfer, Ashton Kutcher, yep. Dan Kurt, Gable, Kurt Warner, Dan Kurt Gable. The, it's Kurt a Warner. pretty small list. Gabby and, Douglas, and you have Sean, who's quite literally been named, like America's sweetheart right there in the West Des Moines. She's about to accomplish. She, you're a world champion at that point. Yeah. Doing big things. And Iowa is so special in the sense of community that it has. And 
It's pretty amazing. So continue. So for that week, I think it was five days, I drove down to Iowa State and I um, would train there in the evening. But during the day, I would drive down to Chow's, like our, our the flooded Chow's. And there would just be like at any given moment, probably 500 people there bailing water, stripping the gym, rebuilding the gym, like carpenters from all over the state. The governor was there almost every day. Coca-Cola was shipping in semi trucks full of brand new equipment, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. And there were these like bright red Coca-Cola semis that would just drive in, load up all of like the ruined stuff, unload the new stuff. There would be kids that had no affiliation to Chow's that were like helping repaint and rebuild. And it was it was out of a movie. And I think, again, I was living in such a bubble that I was trying not to allow myself to like feel that pressure. But there was this sense of like, there is no way on earth I could ever repay you for what it is our entire state is doing right now. Mm. And within five days, you guys, they rebuilt our entire gym from the ground up. We had all new equipment. I was training on day five back in Chow's Gymnastics. You had been going to Iowa State? So I had been driving down to Iowa State with Chow at night, and we would train for like three hours. Wow. And then on day five, he's like, it's good enough. Like, I was was surrounded. I remember there was this one moment where I was practicing my, like, Olympic bar routine. And I wish I had a picture, but our bars like backed up to this massive foam pit, right? And it like basically the end of the mat touched the beginning of the pit, which is usually super safe because it's just filled with foam. But at this time on day five, when I came back to the gym to train, I'm like on these bars and it's nothing but a 10 foot drop of concrete. Like there's nothing in there. And there's carpenters down on the bottom, like rebuilding it. And there's firefighters like going through codes and stuff, walking through the the building as I'm casually doing my Olympic bar routine in the back corner of this gym. But I I just will never forget driving up to this gym and seeing the governor, the mayor, the CEO of Coca-Cola, Hy-Vee Semis, the president of Hy-Vee, the president of Wells Fargo, Like, they're all standing in the parking lot, like, asking Chow, what do you need from us? I love that story. It gives me chills every time I hear it. It's so wild. I love it for a couple of reasons. One is because it shows the effect that you have on people, which is really cool. And I still almost tear up when I see Sean meet someone on the street and they say, you're my idol. Thank you so much for inspiring me. And getting me through the hard times of middle school or whatever. And they'll break down crying. Yeah. And you have this effect of being able to rally people. Which makes me so proud as a husband. But two, the sense of community that yeah was displayed. Makes me think of the house fire mm-hmm. in my situation. And it, it, moments like that where it's less than an ideal situation. But there's this glimmer of beauty and unity Mm -hmm. that you never get to see otherwise but then three it's it shows that whatever success you've had or i've had or any of us have had it's built on the shoulders of so many other people putting things in place for us or making sacrifices and it's i don't know i I just love that story it was such an it was such a beautiful experience it was such a hard experience for me because i felt so conflicted there were so many times where i would come up to the gym during the day um i had taken off school i was getting ready for trials whatever and i would be like give me a job like assign me one of these roles what am i doing and everybody would be like go home you're not supposed to be here and it was just such this like guilt-ridden feeling of you're doing this so we can go perform so we can represent des moines I'm not just going to go lay in bed and rest. Like, I can't do that. Yeah. But then it was also so rewarding to be able to go to Olympic trials and win 
and be able to say, there is no way I would be here if it weren't for Des Moines, Iowa. My community, my home, my people. Like, I, I would not have been there. Because, again, think about the perfection that is required from gymnastics. That type of perfection requires so many reps, so many fine tunings on the home stretch the weeks before. And it couldn't have happened without these people. No. It was so cool. Anyways. Okay, so let me tell you a story about how I ended up at Vanderbilt, which yes. is ultimately the reason that Sean and I met. Think yeah. about that. I'm this high school player out of Indiana. My high school team was not good. Uh, there had been one player that went to play D1 college football in the past like eight years. Nobody really knew. Like we were a two and ten team, not good. And I have this dream that I was going to play D1 football like my dad did. He played at Purdue, and I grew up putting on his helmet, walking around the house. That was all I wanted to do. I was going to play at any D1 school that wanted me. And so my coaches weren't helping me out. My like my talent wasn't really helping me out. I was not this outstanding athlete like Sean. And not true. And so I had done everything I could think of, emailed every single D1 special teams coach, made a list of their email addresses, sent out my my a link to my tape. That's what ultimately got me into YouTube, actually. Yeah. Um, was uploading my football tape. Sent them like this, you know, letter about how much it meant to me. I would go to all these summer camps. And one of the camps I went to was Vanderbilt. And I'll never forget the coach there, Warren Beelan, wow. like loved me. Yeah, no, I, I, dude, these people changed my life. Yeah. And I go, they couldn't offer me a scholarship because they were fully booked. They had already offered all their scholarships they had available. So signing day comes and goes my senior year, which is – this day where athletes decide, like, make this big decision, you know, they'll put on a hat and say, I'm going to Florida or I'm going mm -hmm. to Tennessee. And it's always on ESPN. It's a big deal. It's usually the last day that you have to decide, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, if you're a highly recruited athlete, that's when you make your decision. So I had no offers, thus didn't make a decision. And I was going to go play D3 football at Wheaton College, which is where my brother JD was As playing. As a walk-on? As a well, D three doesn't do scholarships. Okay. Um. So yes, Princeton had also looked at me and had interest, but they had just had a coaching change. The guy's name was Bob something or other, and so like they weren't very communicative. I didn't feel like I was wanted there and mm -hmm. wasn't excited about it. So I was kind of discouraged until I get a call while I'm up in my room doing homework. It was the first week of April, which at this point all these normal students who don't play sports have usually already decided where they're going to school too. And um, I get a call from Bobby Johnson, who's the head coach of Vanderbilt, who I hadn't heard from in months, mm -hmm. like since the last summer. And he said, Andrew, we got a scholarship spot open and we want you to take it. And I was like, what? What do you mean? You're already giving them all away. Like how, how do you have an extra one? He's like, we don't have an extra one. One of our highest rated recruits, his name is Ray John Bennett, like one of the best recruits Vanderbilt had ever yeah. gotten. He was a running back out of Atlanta, uh, had a handicapped little brother and a mom who was dating someone. And this boyfriend broke into the house with a gun and started shooting around. And Rajon jumped in front of his handicapped little brother to save him and took a bullet for him and died. Mm -hmm. It was this big headline story. Um, and because this happened, they had an extra scholarship spot for me that they wanted me to take. And it was this conflict of emotions because... And Bobby Johnson told you this story on the phone call. Yes. Yes. And this had been like a week or two maybe after the, the story came out. But on the one hand, it's my dream come true, right? Yeah. And it was everything I ever wanted, but under such terrible circumstances. Mm -hmm. So I accept the offer. It's a dream come true. And show up to the campus... And really didn't feel like I ever belonged because, one, I felt like I got there on a fluke. Two, everyone else in my class and I already met each other. Three, when I got there, the coach who had just offered me a scholarship, Bobby Johnson, retired. So we had this other coach. I tore my hamstring. And there was like this whole weird – it was like a rocky start at Vanderbilt. But I would always 
refer back to Rajan and how I got there. And I felt like I owed him something that I needed to apply to my experience. But he wrote this essay that always provided inspiration for me. And he said this, he said, my drive cannot be stopped or even slowed down because every obstacle has a way around it. Every day I become stronger from the weights physically, from the books mentally, and from life emotionally. There is no limit to my strength. And at the end of the day, I want to be known as the strongest. He talks about God in this essay, and that's just a short paragraph, but that really Mm -hmm. helped me through this rocky time at a place that he should have been at. And we walked out of there uh, ultimately as the winningest class in Vanderbilt history. Mm -hmm. I did have four coaches in five years. Um, You were one of the captains two years in a row as a long snapper. Yeah. Which is unheard of. I I think about the parallels too. I I feel like in my faith, there's something there that I haven't been able to fully dial in, but it's like I only had this opportunity or access to this good life experience because someone made a a huge sacrifice lost their life right Uh, I don't know I just think about that and I wanted to tell the story because it means a lot to me Mm -hmm. and I always like to pay pay Rajan homage I never got to meet the guy I've met his mom but I just feel like uh, yeah that's really cool yeah they would do like uh, memorial services anyway so it's like as special to me. And I think about everything that that changed. We're in Nashville now because of Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. I met you because of Vanderbilt. And it's just wild, these ripple effects that life has. I remember coming in to Vandy, to football, to your whole story early on when we were starting dating. And I remember thinking, I knew enough about football to know like, I don't want to say reputations or expectations on different positions and different like teams, but to see the impact you had on your team as a long snapper was so cool. And even talking to coach Franklin these days, he still makes it back for weddings and it's this group of you. There's like five of you who just led this team for so many years and we're such <clears throat> amazing role models, and it's just really cool to see. Like you felt like you had this debt hanging over your head your whole college career, but like you stepped up to it, and it was really, really special to witness. I appreciate that, babe. Yeah. Ah, uh, so we vlogged this. If you guys haven't seen the vlog story, go watch it. I was pregnant with Drew. I was two weeks out of our C-section, our induction date. And our neighbor next door had just had her baby. We were a couple weeks apart. And they also had just gotten a new puppy. And she invited us over to come meet the puppy, come meet the baby, come hang out. We walked over. We're hanging out on the back patio. Um, We were holding the baby for a while. All these things. She had made chili. Her and Andrew go in to get chili. I'm super pregnant. And as they're like walking inside to get chilly, I walk out onto the patio, which has like this stone wall. that's probably three feet tall. Yeah. And it's like on top of the stone wall is their yard. So it's kind of like built up and the puppies out there. And I'm like calling Bo and I'm like, Bo, come here. And he comes running. He's adorable. Mind you, at the moment, I currently don't have shoes on. I'm just walking around barefoot, which is my M.O., The puppy comes sprinting. He stops like (laughs) hard on the wall, which is made of like cinder blocks, basically. He dislodges a cinder block on the top level and it falls directly on my big toe, Mm. like square. Mm. And it was just immediate shock because I was like, my toe is detached from my body. I have never been so scared in my life just to look down. (laughs) Because I really didn't think my toe was attached anymore. I thought it was gone. I thought I was going to see just bloody mess everywhere. And I take a couple deep breaths. The first thought was like, don't send yourself into labor. Because I was so close. You so, think about the physiological response. Like, you know, you know when you get hurt and your whole body like yeah. breaks out in the sweat and yes. you feel that like ping that yes. goes everywhere. But 
it was just immediate shock. And I was like, calm down. And I was like talking to myself. I was just taking a deep breath. I was like, do not send yourself into labor. Keep breathing, keep breathing. And then I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to move. I don't know how to walk. Because at this point, I had looked down. My toe was still connected, but I was like, my foot is shattered. In my mind, it wasn't just my toe, but like my foot, there was so much pain that I was like, my foot shattered. So there's like halfway in between where we were sitting and where I was, there was a table and I kind of like hobbled back and I sat down for a second. I was like, okay, what do I do? And I remember sitting there and I was like, Andrew, (laughs) just trying to like stay calm, but like get his attention and nobody's responding. He's still inside with um, our neighbor getting food. I'm cutting it up. We're laughing, having a good time, watching football or something. So then I I remember like trying to yell out to you a couple of times, but again, I didn't want to like if I yelled, it would have sounded like panic. So I just had to like stay calm. I'm like, Andrew. Finally, I was like, okay, I need to make it back up onto the, the porch. So I like hobble my way onto the porch and sit down. And I finally get your attention and you come out before our neighbor, who's like newly postpartum. And I was like, babe. And I think by this time you could tell I had like panic on my face a little bit. And you're thinking I'm like going into labor or whatever. I was like, I think I broke my foot. And I, I literally didn't know how to communicate. Whenever Sean's in a pinch, she is way under communicative. She smiles this like meek little smile. <laughs> and it disorients me, to yeah. be honest. Because she's like, she's looking at me with a smile on her face saying, just chilling on this back porch saying she thinks she broke her foot so i'm like all right what do you want to do and honestly i didn't fully buy it i know i know <laughs> he didn't buy it it's hard to i couldn't i didn't want to like cause panic i also was trying to keep myself so calm because i was 39 weeks pregnant and i was just like i need to not lose it because i had i was on the verge of like losing yeah, it i could have i could have done better and understandably I wasn't giving any signs that anything was wrong. Was but wrong. I was thinking, let's just hang out for another hour. So we just got here, kind of. Yeah. Let's hang out with the neighbors, and I'll never forget this. Like, you looking at me, shaking your head, saying, "No, we should go to the emergency room right now." I'm like, "Okay, I guess it's pretty serious. So let's go." We went to the hospital. Yeah, we went to the hospital. I Andrew wheels me in on a wheelchair because I, I by this time I can't walk. Like I I literally had the shakes from like pain, and we walked to the front desk ER and they see me and you can just tell they're like oh no and I was like I'm not in labor I'm not in labor I think I broke my foot and I just kept repeating that because that pregnant people get really concerned and so they're like calling OB down because we have to be monitored we get into our room and finally the ER doc comes in the triage doc remember yeah we we go we got a triage and then back to lobby and then to the doctor we go to the triage like initial scan oh yeah and the doctor confirmed what, what I had been thinking and pretty much said, oh, it looks like you kind of just stubbed your toe. It He's like be fine. wiggling my toe. He was aggressive with it. He was he was just thinking she stubbed her toe. And I was I was like, yeah, he I thought it was like a bone bruise or something. There's there's no way that you broke your toe. And he's like, let's get x-rays regardless. So get x-rays. Then we get carted to the room. We get carted to the room waiting for the specialist and stuff to come back and he finally comes back in and he's he's like giggling he's like smirking he's like well you must have pretty high pain tolerance and i was like what and he finally like pulls out the x-ray and he's like your toe is snapped in half Mm. like there's nothing hanging on like it's it just went boop Mm. and it took you a second to even register like what was happening. And you were like, wait, what? Like it's broken? Well, the contrast of what I thought was happening, I, I literally thought Sean hurt her toe, like a rock fell on it. And I thought that she had low pain tolerance and was making a big deal of something. <laughs> yeah. Come to find out that she had super high pain tolerance and was making a very small yeah. deal of something and she and did break it. It was also around this time we were getting a text from our neighbor's husband a picture of this quote rock that I said fell on it. It was it was kind of like a rectangle piece, this big, probably. It's probably two feet long, 
six inches. It's like square? Yeah. Yeah, big. It was huge. But anyways, now I start panicking because I was like, I can't have surgery. I can't go under anesthesia. I can't take pain medication. Like, I'm so close. And we're calling, like, the orthos and, like, everything. And they're they're just like, you know what? There's really nothing we can do here. <laughs> they kind of, like, tape me up. And they're like, uh, good luck. And I remember fast forward two weeks later to the induction. I was in labor for 27 hours. We went then went into a C-section. And the whole time I was like, just don't touch my toe, please. Just don't touch yeah. my toe. That was such a bummer because we had this big plan of uh, going on walks every day. And I was really worried about postpartum depression. So I was thinking we were going to take a walk, watch comedies. And the toe kind of I literally reduced couldn't do your anything. mobility. So you did a great job. And That sucker hurt. Lesson learned on my part to never doubt. <laughs> but also, you just got to communicate, you know, like make a little bit of a bigger deal. Um, so I know. I also, <laughs> I, it was one of those where I was either, I had to stay calm or I was going to go into full-fledged panic hysterics. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Those are good stories. At least I thought so. Yeah. Let us know if you want a, another one of these episodes. Thank you for watching all the way uh, through. Let us know what your favorite story was so we can pull up more. We have a whole list. Just a whole list of stories here. Whole list. I can scroll through them. Some are... Yeah, I think they're all pretty good, actually. But if you haven't yet, hit the subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up. And stay tuned for next week. That's all we got. I'm Andrew. I'm Sean. We're the East Fam. <laughs>